It's 12 p.m. And Rako is trying to explain to his wife during their intimate moment why he's calling a next woman's name. A 15-year-old girl is traumatized and she cuts herself over and over again when she thinks about her rape experience. Django is up at 3 a.m. and he is pacing the floor trying to figure out a way to tell his girlfriend about an abortion. Meanwhile, Lovado is on his phone and he's watching porn and masturbating. And John Doe takes one of his male friends home but fails to tell him that he has several STDs. The question is, how did we get here? And the reality is that we are living in a hypersex culture. Our minds are bombarded every single day, every second, every moment with sexual images, in the movies, in the music, books, magazines, and all of these things, they teach a twisted view of sex. And from observation and personal experiences, we see that the culture has become the dominant voice and expert when it comes to sex and our sexuality. The influence is so strong that we see it in the various scenarios that I mentioned before. Earlier this week in preparation, I asked a question on my Facebook page. Where did you first learn about sex? And most of the response was this. I learned it from the TV. I learned it from school, romance novels, peers, video clips. Someone said the bold and the beautiful. One person said, my mom taught me when I first heard and saw about it on the television, and I thank God that she did that. One other person said, I learned in Sunday school, and the way that they taught me was judgment and hellfire. That if you go and have sex, you will certainly end up in hell. But what was astounding to me was that I never ever hear the words church or pastor. And the truth is, the church generally, we've become silent. We've become naive and overprotective when it comes to the subject of sex. And while we are trying to hide what we're supposed to be teaching our kids, the culture is doing a fantastic job. And so the church is playing what I call a catch-up. We are reacting instead of being the trendsetters. So I ask, how did we get here? And there's only one way for this to happen. It is to take something that was created good and spoil it. Would you go to a gynecologist if you need your teeth clean? Would you go to Dr. Afolabi for legal advice? If you have an upset stomach, would you go to a lawyer? No, because these individuals have a specialized field. And it's the same way a Ford company cannot take their vehicle to Suzuki because Suzuki is not the manufacturer for the Ford vehicle. And the same way the Suzuki company cannot take their vehicle to a Ford company. They're not the manufacturers. They're not the makers. And the point is we cannot take advice and cues from the culture. 
because when it comes to sex we must go to the original manufacturer the one who created it for a specific purpose so today family on your outline let's talk about what's up with sex not to condemn those who are living a promiscuous life but to point you to the truth of God's word secondly the goal of this message is to offer hope and deliverance to those who have been bound by all sort of sexual sins and number three I am not an expert on the topic of sex but the word of God is so make a note of this my sexuality is designed by God. And so I want us to keep this thought in mind that my human sexuality is designed by God and defined by God's word. So when we talk about my sexuality is designed by God, the original manufacturer, let's go to Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 28. You're going to put that up on the screen so that you can see Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God, watch this, talk about the design. God created man in his own image. He created him. But he created them male and female. Somebody say check. check. Let me say that again. So he created them male and female. Somebody say check. check. So you underline that. The design is male and female he created them and God blessed them and said to them be fruitful and multiply fill the earth subdue it have dominion over the fish of the sea and over every thing So my sexuality is designed by God. God created male and God created female. So let's establish that sex was created by God. Let's establish that. Sex was created by God. If you're comfortable with that, we're comfortable with sex? Yeah, we're comfortable? Because everybody sitting here know what I'm talking about. So if we go outside of this church, you will hear some conversations. Right? So, so, so let's not just sit and be like, oh, he's talking about sex and, um, oh my God, this is so wrong. So, so let's, let's talk about this. Breathe. Somebody breathe. Just breathe. We're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. So sex was created by God. But notice, male, female in the context of marriage. Okay? Some of us know that. Some of us don't. So he created sex. But also sex is a gift that he gave to Adam and Eve and he gave them this gift for a purpose. So track with me and let's look at the four purposes of sex. Here's the first one, to reproduce. Everybody say that. Reproduce. So the first purpose of sex is to do what? Reproduce. reproduce. What does that mean? It means to have image bearers your sons and daughters brought up in a godly home must reflect and resemble our living God by the principles that you're teaching them that's the purpose of sex so let me break it down a little further that the blessing of sex is not orgasm the blessing of sex is not pleasure. The blessing of sex is when you see your son or daughter, if you're married, living a godly life at age 16, 17, serving God, 
discipling people, they get married, they get kids, and their kids are now walking in God's way. And you as a grandfather and a grandmother, you sit back and you smile. That's the blessing of sex. Pleasure and orgasm are byproducts. Secondly, bonding and consummation. God help me today. Genesis 2.24, therefore, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to many wives. Oh, I got to read that again. Hold fast to his wife. Okay, okay. Uh, one. So, so hold fast to his wife. Leave your parents' house and go meet the woman. So there's a leaving and there's a cleaving. And guess what? The two become one flesh. Now I'm going to give you a footnote for you to read Deuteronomy 22, 13 to 19. Read that and you'll understand how serious this is. So there's a bonding and a consummation that takes place when it comes to sex. The word in Genesis 2, 24 is a word that is called ikad. It means one flesh to fuse together at the deepest level. It means that when two people bond together, they become not only one flesh, but body, soul, and spirit. So when you bond with someone outside of marriage, guess what? It's body, soul, and spirit. So if you bond with many men and women, they are carrying different spirits. So in the context of marriage, Ikad is beautiful. So, so when you have sex with your husband and your wife, you, you hold each other, you embrace, it keeps you together. That's why you go back. And that's why as a husband and a wife, you can't be satisfied with a month. You can't tell your husband or your wife, you know what, uh, next month. <laughs> because it is safe in the context of marriage. Okay. Outside of marriage, when you indulge in such activity, women are viewed as objects for self-gratification. So when you have an exchange of multiple partners, you tear a card. And, and, and what happens is that a part of you is lost. And when you repeat that over and over, you become empty, you become hollow. That's why women carry scars. That's why men carry so much pain and discomfort because when they finally get ready to settle down, there's problems. Because she's going to tell you, you ain't ready yet like, like Johnny. Bonding and consummation. And because that is so important in marriage, protection. 1 Corinthians 7, 3 to 5. Marriage is for protection. Some of us think God is putting these restrictions, but it's protection. Yes, yes. Married people, it's, it's protection from pornography. It's protection from affair. So that's why you do it. Because it's good. In the sight of God. And then there's recreation. Yeah. Married folks, it's recreation. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15 and 20. I want you to write that down. And I want you to look at what it says. Proverbs chapter 5, 15 to 20. We have that? I want to show you the importance of recreation. Anybody find it? 
When you find it, say amen. All right. It's going to be so important. Proverbs 5, 15 to 20. Listen to what it says. Drink water from your own cistern. <laughs> Think the Bible, Bible ain't easy, you know. God, God good, you know. Listen. Drink water from your own cistern. Flowing water from your own well. I don't have to tell you what I mean. Married people. Okay. Okay. Watch, watch this. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets. Okay. Okay. Men going around. Going around. And spreading their seeds in the streets. Hmm. Let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you, lest your fountain be blessed. And rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely dear, a graceful doe, and let her breast fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. And why? Should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman? It ain't me saying it. It's in the word. So recreation. So when God created everything, family, he said that everything was good, which means that sex is good in the sight of God in the context of marriage. But something terrible happened in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. And then sin, guess what? Sin entered the world. Adam and Eve became naked. They hid themselves immediately. Now, before, Adam and Eve were naked. They ain't got no shame. She wasn't covering her eyes, and he wasn't covering his eyes. That was purity. I wonder if you get the picture of how God created this sex thing in the confines of marriage. Purity. But when sin entered shame, that's why we cover up. You look at kids, they have no shame. They'll run around naked. Because it's kids. But you wonder where the shame came from? It's because of the sin of Adam and Eve. And guess what? God's beautiful gift is now corrupt. So make a note of this. Our sexuality is broken because of sin. Our sexuality is broken because of sin. Romans 3.23 and Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 are the supporting text and you would see that. It's broken. But let me show you, after the fall, how broken sex became. In Genesis 4.19, we are introduced to a man by the name of Lamech. This is where polygamy started. Because he had two wives. Genesis 2.24 says a man must leave and cleave to his wife. Lamech had two wives. In Genesis 6, 1 to 3, it says here that the sons of God saw the woman. Right? In Genesis 6, 1 to 3, they saw the woman as beautiful. And guess what? They engaged, they had sexual relations with them. But this is not the spiritual purpose for which God created sex. You see the perversion. This is why in Genesis 6 and verse 3, God's response was, I am going to shorten their lifespan to 120 years. As a matter of fact, 120 years, I'm going to give them some time, Bible scholars say, to, to repent. But then in verse 5 of Genesis chapter 6, we observe that God regretted that he made man. When he saw how their hearts were evil. And then in Genesis chapter 7, guess what God did? Because of your perversion, I'm going to wipe the earth completely with a flood. So Noah, build this ark. And after you build this ark, Noah... I'm going to give you some instructions. Call the animals in two by two. Watch the design. He said, call them in male 
and female. A male rabbit and a female rabbit. The design of God because the intent of God was to repopulate the earth. But then we see in Genesis chapter 16, Abraham sleeps with Hagar. Why? Because God would have promised Abraham and Sarah a son. Isaac, the promised seed. They couldn't wait. It's like some people know I can't wait. You tell your church people telling me about wait to get sex. Are you crazy? <laughs> Abraham couldn't wait. Became a mess. In Genesis 19, further perversion. Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. Two, two men, two male guests decide to go into Lot's house. Say, Lot, God is going to destroy this place. Get your family out. Lot was so steep into the activities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Bible says that the men of Sodom only saw two men went into that house. And those boys take off. And they began to beat down the door. Let us in so we could have sex with these men. Lord said, fellas, I have two virgins. Take the woman. Please take them. The fellas say, hey, we ain't come for that. And on top of that, the angel, or the two angels, they blinded these men. If you are blind, the first place you want to go is home. For safety. But these men still blinded beat down the door the perversion the lifestyle it runs deep in their hearts they couldn't control it those guys had to pull lot in to rescue him and then further perversion in genesis 19 it says here that lot daughters slept with their father now watch this we only in genesis So let me help us. In the New Testament, Paul writes to the church in Corinth about their promiscuous lifestyle. It ain't nothing new. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, Paul is writing to these believers because the city of Corinth was filled with all kind of perversion and sexual immorality. They were saved, but they brought their lifestyle into the church. And Paul had to write to correct that. So what we see here is that our world, it's no different. Perversion runs deep at the core of every single human being when our flesh gets in the way. So our sexuality is broken. It's broken because we have what we call wife swapping. It's broken because prostitution is the thing. It's broken because we have sex toys. And then we have masturbation because the lie of the culture says, hey, please yourself because you won't get STDs, but you're actually having sex with yourself and it's a form of idolatry. And then we have withholding sex from your husband and your wife as a form of punishment and manipulation. For the lies, threesome, foursome, group sex, but we have oral sex because, because there are people, after reading some blogs and articles, they would say, hey, we are still virgins because we participated in oral sex. See the perversion? And there's a new study out that says, hey, oral sex can give you oral cancer. The world says, use a condom because it is safe sex. But let me stop there. That's risky sex. The only safe sex is in marriage when the husband and the wife are faithful to each other. We have marriage being redefined. We have gender non-binary. So a man can say, I feel like a woman. You can't tell me nothing. And a woman can say, I feel like a man. Perversion and darkness, that's right, at the core of it. So, so mankind has moved away from God's original intent. And now, guess what? Profane things become acceptable things. And the truth is, all of us are sexually broken regardless of our status quo and job and background. 
And the brokenness is a loss of identity. So guess what? We have exchanged the truth of God's word and his standard for lies. Remember this, whatever God creates, Satan perverts. So the lies by the culture is this. We are slaves to our sex drive. If you are hormone driven, satisfy yourself. You can't control it, man. And the truth is God created sex in the context of marriage. It is his idea. He is the creator. He gave that gift and God is the one who determines how the gift must be expressed. And then the other lie is that sex is a form of expression and mutual affection. Meaning my feelings are the most legitimate grounds for sex. My feelings? Some of us, we could wake up one morning and feel like we could conquer the world. And the next morning we wake up and we just feel like I don't want to talk to anybody. And we still trust our feelings? Yes. Check James 1, 14 to 15. And Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the heart is deceitful. And guess what? It's desperately wicked. You can't trust your feelings. Your feelings are like a roller coaster. Romans chapter 1 is a perfect picture of the brokenness that we are seeing in our world today. It's preference over God's prescribed way. So our sexual brokenness can cause us to see other sins and not our own. So let me drop a definition for homosexual sin for you. Here's the definition of homosexual sin. It is the denial of the creator God of heaven and earth, original intent to reproduce the image of God through sexual relations by husband and wife. See the definition? Now I'm going somewhere with this. Okay? First Corinthians, watch this. First Corinthians 6, 9 to 16. If you look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 16, it reads and it says, Or oh, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of heaven? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. And we Christians, we run to that verse. So we underline homosexuality and we say to the person who's struggling, ha, you need to change. So we run and we start to say all kinds of things as it relates to them. But I want to give you now a definition for heterosexual sin. So here's the definition for heterosexual sin. It is any act or acts, thoughts, of sexual divergence and deviance from God's original intent and blueprint for sexual relations designed for husband and wife. So let me put this now. Heterosexual sin would include strong petting. Heterosexual sin includes looking at pornography. Heterosexual sin is having those WhatsApp conversations and exchanging images. What I read before was the verse that many Christians would use to criticize homosexuals. Because we circle the homosexual part, but the heterosexual sin part, we will leave out. Sexually immoral, idolaters, you see, we leave out that part. Adulterers. And in verse 10, it says, thieves, people who are greedy, those who are revelers, all of those are heterosexual sin. So here's the point I'm making, we're all in the same boat. And we're all in need of grace. Yes. The struggle with sexual sin is not a struggle with the environment and the people. Our struggle with sexual sin reveals the dark condition of our hearts. In other words, we are the biggest problem. And the thing that rules our hearts will determine our behavior. What you focus on will flourish. What you focus on will flourish. 
our sexual brokenness says that we need a savior. Only God can restore my sexual brokenness. Psalm 119, 9 to 16, David is writing. How can a young person keep their way pure? And he says it. He says it right here in Psalm 119 from verse 9. The first thing he says is to obey the word. So how do you keep pure? Obey the word. Be intentional, verse 10, with seeking God. And then in verse 11, he says, hide the word in your heart. So that word becomes like a security. Hide it in your heart. Recite the word. Reflect on it. Meditate upon it. And then you take delight in it. In other words, the key to restoring our brokenness is repentance. Proverbs 28 and verse 13 says, If you cover your sins, you will not prosper. And some people wonder why you can't get a breakthrough. It's because you're covering that sin. It's because you are hiding that sin. And so God can restore your sexual brokenness. And, and this is what you need to do. We need to do this. We need to repent of acts of broken sexuality in our life. We need to repent. And we need to resist the music and the movies that would lure you back into a sinful thinking and lusting from past experiences. Here's the other one. You need to sever all ties with those you are sexually involved with previously. If our sexuality is to be restored and, and redeemed, we have to take action. You cannot keep his or her phone number. Because it's going to bring back memories. So you could pull out your phone and delete it. Sever it. Get rid of it. For married people, keep sexuality in its proper place. Covenantal love and marriage. Keep it there. It is a bond that keeps you together. And then meditate and pray over specific scripture verses that speak to your struggle. Because scripture has the power to set you free. It has the power to set you free. So meditate on those scripture verses. Because you know what? We know songs easy. But it's a struggle to memorize God's word. We know songs. Yeah, we know when a man loves a woman. That is for the old school. We know that. And then for the young people, Kiki, do you love me? See? 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 So the same way you love the songs, love the word of God. So that the word of God would push out the temptations when they come. Because when the word becomes a home in your heart, when temptations come, you can turn to that temptation. And you can say to that temptation, according to Job 31 and verse 1, I will not set my eyes on anything that is worthless. Because the word becomes a home in your heart. So if you want to memorize the word, put a tune next to it. You go. You'll memorize it faster. Parents, here's my admonition to you. You need to discuss with your children sex and any sexual immorality that they see on the television or in the cartoons, use that as a teaching moment. Yes, sir. Because other people are teaching them. So let it come from you as a godly parent. And I would say this, there are many of us in this room who are struggling with strongholds. But strongholds don't grow overnight. Strongholds grow over many nights. And some of you have some serious strongholds 
that you need God to set you free from. And only God alone could set you free. Some of you are battling with some issues in your heart, and we're going to pray. And you need God to break those strongholds. And if you believe that God can break those strongholds, we are going to pray and believe that those strongholds will be shattered in the name of Jesus. That there's some of you here, you have this strong affection for women and men. So whether you are a bisexual or a lesbian or a homosexual, this church says we welcome you without judgment. Amen. So, so we welcome you without judgment. But we need you to understand that if you don't repent of your sins, you will face judgment. So I put it like this. You are wrong, but you are loved. You are wrong in your actions, but we still love you. So the question I want to ask this morning to every single one of us, what is forming in your life right now that you're not taking the opportunity to address? So think about that as we, as we pray and as we worship God. What is forming in your life that you have not taken the time to address? It's a question that came in my mind during the course of this week. We're going to have some people who are going to be praying for you here at the altar. And we want you to come forward. We want you to just say, God, I've been struggling. God, there's so many things going on in my life. But only you can break the chains. Some of those chains run from your childhood. Some of you have been molested at four and five years. It's not your fault. I will tell you that it's not your fault. It's unfortunate, but God can heal every scar. He can give you beauty for ashes. He can redeem. He can restore. And if you're here this morning, don't be ashamed. We are ready to pray. We're ready to pull the strongholds down in the name of Jesus. You can be free today. Don't walk out of here without someone praying for you and believing that God can radically touch your life. Every chain is going to be broken over your life. Those of you who are addicted for years, you've been crying and praying and the struggle is real. But there's no way out. But we're going to pray through and ask God to deliver you today.